Ahoy! Joe Buddy Hamboat here, and I'm back again with a brand new coupon code from our friends over at Noble Knight Games. This month, it's going to be Love RPGs, and it's going to be running now all the way through Valentine's Day. So you can get $5 off any order of $25 or more, either online or in person over at Noble Night Games. Now, there has never been a better time than right now, especially if we're still hanging out at home to pick up some more games to play with our friends and family. So swing on by to noblenight.com and pump in the code LOVERPGs and get $5 off any order over $25 or more. And don't forget, Noble Knight has a killer trade-in program, so if you've got some older games that you're just not feeling anymore, or if you just need to make some space for some brand new ones, Noble Knight's got you covered. So if you're shopping over at Noble Knight Games between now and Valentine's Day, make sure you use the code LOVERPGS, that's L-O-V-E-R-P-G-S, to get $5 off any order of $25 or more from our friends over at Noble Knight Games. This is the Vintage RPG Podcast, your source for the best in classic and contemporary RPGs, with your hosts, Hambone and Stu. Welcome to the Vintage RPG Podcast, coming at you again from the clubhouse, hidden somewhere in the swamps of New Jersey. I'm John Hambone McGuire, and today we've got a great show for you. We've got Eric Swanson, and we've got Michael Dunn O'Connor here to talk to us tonight about their latest release, Rebel Crown. So without further ado, let's get right into it. Eric, Michael, how's it going today? Yeah, it's great. It's great. How are you? You know, we can't complain. It is another day in paradise here in the end, Garden State of New Jersey. <laughs> it's the promised land, the new promised land. So we've been told. We have Taylor Ham, snow, <laughs> and I don't know, swamps. Mostly swamps. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So before we talk about Rebel Crown, I kind of want to talk a little bit about Goblinville. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So how did Goblinville come together? Where did it come from? Why did you decide that goblins were cute and needed to be reformed in the eyes of players? You know, <laughs> how did it all come together? In the super early playtests, we started out with a resolution system, and we were looking at this way of presenting resolution. I kind of messed around with other kind before, which is based on a really kind of an older Vincent Baker game. But this resolution where you have multiple outcomes, usually some of them that you really don't want, and then you roll dice, and then the players are choosing between bad outcomes. And so a kind of resolution system that would really broadcast stakes really clearly and then give players interesting narrative choice, like in the middle of the action. And it worked super well for a dungeon crawler. And then we started kind of like jamming and we do, I think we'll talk about this probably a couple of times. And I know you have more to add on this point, Eric. We do a lot of smaller iterations of games. And one of the things we're iterating was like, we made this dungeon crawler where like, you almost never get exactly what you want. And I think the shift to goblins help us kind of like soften the blow of that to players. (laughs) Like you go in and you're like, oh man, I have to choose between three horrible things. And then you feel great when you like scrape by with getting what you wanted or getting a compromise you can live with. And I think having scrappy goblins help players get into that like underdog mentality where those choices felt interesting right off the bat and never stung too bad and then it really then it really kind of built from there i think the next thing that really brought it off was your art style eric i think seeing your goblins really added a lot to the tone of the game and we kind of designed adventures from there yeah yeah i think like the reforming the image of goblins kind of i don't think it was like a like the primary focus you know (laughs) but it just sort of happened you know i was determined to find some type of you know, visual style. And uh, I, I finally hit on one and I just couldn't stop drawing. So um, them being cute was a, also kind of an accident. <laughs> <laughs> you mean goblins aren't naturally cute? Yeah, I think so. Like a pug, you know, like a, <laughs> like an ugly, cute dog or something, you know? Yeah. I feel like there's precedent for that. The goblins in uh, Labyrinth, for instance, mm-hmm. they're, all, they're all cute and yeah. doggy, doggish. And even like in the same way, some of like Hoggle's personality, like he's kind of a jerk, but you kind of <laughs> like him for it, right? Like he's kind of puckish. 
Yeah. And I think we were going more with that angle than some of the like really like vicious mean or like subhuman goblin angle for sure. Well, I well, think like, yeah. arm of like the bad news bears. <laughs> but in right, a very yeah. RPG sense, like you're rooting for these scrappy little dudes and maybe you shouldn't be, but you can't help yourself being on their side. Yeah. And I think we then in the adventures extended that to other kind of fantasy creatures or whatever like nobody's like evil or like everybody's got an agenda in the adventures that we wrote for goblin bill even if that agenda like an owl creature is more like animal instinct there's nothing out there just to be cruel there are no targets out there that you're just supposed to go obviously kill Mm -hmm. either like fighting something is generally even if it's the scale is you know almost equal Fighting is generally not a great idea in the game. We also kind of wanted to push other ways to resolve problems and scenarios when it had to do with the creatures or other denizens of of dungeons and stuff. And that connects back to the resolution, right? That the stake setting and the resolution is for anything, right? For like, it's not like you have a separate system that's more ornate for combat and then a simplified system for other stuff. You kind of resolve all stakes in a similar way so it doesn't, intentionally nudge you to one approach it doesn't uh tell you that that's like the main way to solve your problems or anything yeah and i'm glad you brought this up because i think about goblinville a lot this past year because of the debate over orcs and drow in dungeons and dragons where Mm -hmm. it's like the pet peeve of mine because i i'm like there's more playing games than dungeons and dragons (laughs) So like, well, yes, I think that that's an important issue. And there's sort of like a fretting over how D&D is going to handle it. It's like, there's so many games that handle this specific topic better. And Goblinville is one of them because like it makes the the characters that you don't give a second thought about a class of character, the the goblin or like the kobold, the lowly cannon fodder. And it makes you really care about them when you pull them out of that D&D context. And you do that so well. and, And all of the systems sort of overlay to kind of, build that empathy for these poor schmucks who are going to get smeared. (laughs) Like they're just doing what they're doing. The odds aren't good for the goblins, you know? (laughs) Yeah. Like regardless of who they bump into, even if it's just themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Like the goblins back at home are always screwing stuff up. Like you go out, you're trying to make life better for goblin, goblin kind, you know, on this expedition to get, you know, bring back something to build in your town. And then you get back and they burn the place down. You're just like, Oh man, (laughs) Like three of our guys died and now we, we got to start all over, you know? I love how that all kind of combines and complicates and, and compounds as you kind of play. And uh, one of the things that we have in the game is the marching order. And it's a randomized way to figure out where the danger, which goblin is kind of more exposed to danger and which ones are kind of, you know, in the back of the line. And I was thinking if there were humans or, or a mix of, you know, like a regular D&D party or whatever, it would be because they planned it that way. Yeah. You know, like the tough guys in the front, just those kind of tropes. But goblins, it's like, I don't know why I'm in the front. Like, I didn't mean to be in the front. <laughs> They're just wandering around. It, it's just a, a bit of like organized chaos. And then once the action starts popping off, it's kind of like uh, impulse control problems just cascading. <laughs> So yeah, so a lot of the things, a lot of the rules in the context of them being goblins, it just feels goblin-y. You know, you kind of think of it in a goblin-y kind of chaotic, you know, skin of your teeth kind of way. So it was kind of fun. And I think connecting back to what you were saying, Stu, about the different ways, like people that come fretting over how it's represented in D&D, I think that's too, a lot of how it's fretting over how it's represented in the text. Like I think people at their table often have totally different representations of how goblins are, right? They've got more likable goblins if they have one playable in their game or drow or or whatever the group is. But I think maybe it's just having text that like really reinforce that and give opportunities for that to be like a, for people to get on the same page for like how that's going to work. Like what kind of goblins are are we playing here? For sure. And actual D&D products have done that too. Like you have Hmm. Meepo in the video games, the kobold that was like the adorable kobold that you know, hung around with you. He was a bard. He was a terrible bard. Mm. That shifts how you view kobolds from that point on. Mm -hmm. It's just one of those like pet peeve things for me where it's just like, there's so many things that like D&D offers like a really specific kind of experience. And there's other places that you could look for different takes on stuff, Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. that you never read 
stuff about that. It's always D and D is the only role playing game that bums me out. <laughs> <laughs> but forget about that. But let's talk about happier things and new things. What is Rebel Crown? Rebel Crown is a a forged in the dark game of feudal intrigue. It's a game about a claimant, someone who was heir to the throne in this kingdom and whose claim was stolen from them. And they were cast into exile or maybe there was an attempted assassination. They were kind of brought away from the seat of power. And one player plays the claimant and then the other players play people with a strong attachment to the claimant, members of the claimant's retinue who are willing to put their lives on the line to see that claimant sat upon the throne. And so it's a game about feudal intrigue where there's kind of like plotting and sword fighting and scheming, but it's also a game about relationships in some ways because uh, rather than kind of like asking players to find a connection between characters to make that dynamic interesting, it like really bakes that into the playbooks that come to the table. So one character type you might play is the devoted, someone who is with the claimant because they love the claimant, you know, like whether that's romantic or, or a deep friendship, personal bond. And so their connection's more personal. And so they might really like care about the claimant more than they care about the claimant's ascent to the crown. And another player might be the vengeance who's someone who wants revenge on the factions that the claimant is up against. And so they might be prodding them to more direct or aggressive actions, but still like really in it and really invested in the claimant's quest. And so it's designed to be a system that has driven characters with a clear shared end goal, though different approaches, and kind of a set campaign arc. Like at some point you win the game if the claimant is crowned, and you lose if they in some way abandon their quest. It started out partially as a way to explore a little more asymmetry in player character types, uh, to have one character who's more central to the story than others, and then kind of mess with that because the claimant's character's role is really actually about pulling the other characters into the, into the spotlight, like asking for counsel and pushing them to take risks in this kind of perilous quest and see if it happens or not. And because the players have such a clear purpose, it's a game that can be really player driven on that campaign level where they like can kind of set goals and say like, oh, we wanna go after this faction next or we wanna make friends with this faction next and let the GM like run from there. Are there goblins? <laughs> <laughs> no, there's really very little supernatural, anything really, or, you know, or non fantasy mm -hmm. elements except for Michael. Oh, I would thought you were going to go with the race. Yeah. The kingdom has fallen under a deep curse that the dead no longer like pass beyond this plane, but still like linger and haunt the living. In some ways, like it's a haunted kingdom and a stolen throne. And in some ways that's had really cool effects on the campaign structure because you can't have huge battles if everyone who dies is going to be risen again as a more <laughs> powerful and threatening enemy. And so it keeps it to a more small human scale, like a group like the retinue, maybe your four or five players at the table feel like they can have this outsized impact on a world that's kind of like scared of, of large, group of, uh, large group battles. And it also means that you as a GM can really have fun like haunting players with the consequences of their actions. Um, if they think the easiest way to the throne is killing their enemies, then you bring those enemies back or you bring back the people they the sacrifices they made in this bigger quest and that really is it i think we tried to pair back some like there's no like sorcerer class or someone who's maybe has their own arc or agenda to like stumble into apart from the main quest i think keeping people all on the same kind of level of stakes has been useful but the race are there and it's kind of surprising the way it's, that they ended up shaping gameplay it comes off as flippant me asking if you put goblins in it, but <laughs> it's actually a serious sort of question, like because it's such a clear contrast between the two games. You know, one feels sort of silly light, and the other feels sort of heavy and weighted and very, you know, cloak and dagger. I'm wondering why such the dramatic shift in sort of tone. I don't know. Michael had to do with, you know, basically like the, the core design of, of both of those games, but I don't know. You just make different stuff, right? I mean, I think, I, 
<laughs> that's the that's the simple answer maybe yeah is you <laughs> you have different games for different moods right like we played a shitload of goblin bill right in like the last two years <laughs> a lot yeah. of goblin bill. guys i'm just all out of laps we got to do something <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think in some ways it's like, what's the game we want to be playing and like looking for something instead of like something that like really works in a con one shot, like playing Goblin Bill at cons is like excellent. Yeah, super easy. People like just had such a good time. Like people like kind of freaking out about how much fun they had. <laughs> and it was really pretty gratifying. But actually one thing I'll say about Goblinville, I think the initial reaction by people is generally oh this is so cute this is funny this is silly but when you play it and you're kind of like playing it with the rules as written and how we intend it it's serious mm -hmm. i mean it's lighthearted, but like the consequences are serious oh yeah you know if you f around if you have that jerk bard or rogue player that just doesn't really pay attention to what's going on <laughs> and just wants to f around they're gonna die and i've had that happen in my games you know you will die if you don't try to take care of your, of your pals and kind of keep your eyes on the prize. So it's a deceptively kind of a serious game, actually, when you get into it, because we wanted the rules to kind of be tough, make good decisions, like go for it, you know, go for broke. But, you know, you're always going to be on that razor's edge. When I posted about it, I the only game that I could really compare it to was Torchbearer, which is such a grueling, punishing survival game. I like that contrast because, you know, Torchbearer takes itself very seriously in its presentation. And you contrast sort of the grueling with the, the lightheartedness of the goblins. Uh, right. Is there a similar sort of fake out in Rebel Crown? Is it, does it on the surface, does it seem like, well, this should be like heavy intrigue. And then like, there's like a comic heart. Mm. <laughs> there are maybe some hidden through lines between the games. I think there are things that we both like game design and, and in games that we play that we sometimes port in ourselves in both games your characters who are really like have some reason to be in it together for goblinville it's it's pretty like existential survival stuff like you mm -hmm. have like the same town that you like need to keep running and you need to uh keep each other fed and like helping actions and that like player interaction are pretty tied into the flow of play and in Rebel Crown, it's because you have like this shared kind of political agenda that becomes existential, right? The claimant gets it or they get executed in, <laughs> in most likelihood. So I think those like characters who have a drive, who care about something that gives them interesting stakes, like, you know, who they are and, and what they need from their, from their world uh, and who are like really believably in it together. The party isn't like a contrivance, but really has a reason that, to be linked. And I think maybe if there's like a twist in the premise of Rebel Crown, it's that there's a lot more in the game, in the character relationships that becomes apparent over time. Like you see the stakes to the intrigue at first. And I think getting the character dynamics and when you're like seeking solace with other characters and like trying to like hit your XP triggers by really like pulling each other into the stakes of a situation, you can see it's a game about like maybe friendship, right? Like maybe about having relationships with people you really care about, even when things suck. So in a lot of ways, it does become like a deeper kind of humor, the kind of humor that you can get only through the bonds of friendship and through knowing people for a lifetime in some ways, which you're essentially trying to play out through this game and hopefully not getting killed by the time, you know, the bill comes due. Is it something where you look at something like a Goblinville where there is the idea of like played as written and played as intended versus kind of, you know, you said it was a great con game for people when they picked it up, the artwork brings them into it, and then they just kind of start rolling with it and bringing their own idea and interpretation to what that gameplay experience should be. Whereas with Rebel Crown, it seems like you definitely have that played as intended, played as written, but automatically giving them a heads up that this is going to be a much richer experience. Right, yeah. We give a lot of atmosphere and a lot of tone. The rules are based on Blades in the Dark, which is another game that had a very, very specific sort of like visual style and theme. It was a game about something very specific, you know, and you, of course you bring your own flair and flavor and ideas into it, but, you know, it's a game that does a certain thing and feels a certain way. And uh, Rebel Crown is a similar thing. We give you enough to kind of inspire you and then you can kind of take it in your own direction and i think in both eric the, the choices you made in art and layout direct people to 
that experience, right? Like in Goblinville, so much of it is character art, right? And you get that, like, if you're unsure what the flavor of Goblin is, you can see the charm in those characters and get it. And in Rebel Crown, I think so much of your attention went to like the maps and the sigils and the kind of the political landscape of it that I think people can see like, oh, there's like, there's an epic sweep here, right? Like there's a bigger scale that we can be playing this at. And then the like more personal stuff seeps in through the cracks. Right. Yeah. What was it like switching from, you know, doing your own bespoke kind of system to working with, you know, a hack of Blades in the Dark? Well, you more straightforward. Goblinville was a, like a synthesis of a lot of different things mm -hmm. and figuring out how they fit together and work together. There was more of a process there, um, but with Forged in the Dark, it's kind of a tried and true thing. So we just had to figure out what we wanted and what we needed to execute like the vision of what Michael wanted to kind of get across with the game. So it was a little more straightforward, I would say. I mean, right, Mike? Yeah, I'd agree with that. And you end up having to question a lot of fundamentals. Are we bringing this in because it's in other Forged and Dark, Dark games or is this really what makes sense here? Or do we need to add a new thing? You know, yeah. um, when we did a couple new little twists in there, which is kind of what we're supposed to do when we're hacking a game. I do think it's kind of funny that everything that is made with Forged in the Dark kind of just has a hint of that Dishonored vibe to it. Mm. I actually don't particularly care for the Dishonored video games, but I like the idea of them. So like Blades of the Dark really kind of scratched like the itch for Dishonored that Dishonored didn't scratch in a weird way. And you sort of have another layer of that. Mm -hmm. The core idea of the game is getting your throne back. I've always loved kind of the epic sweet story for a role-playing game, but they so very rarely have the, uh, the mechanical framework to kind of like sustain that sort of story. Mm -hmm. And I think that the Forge in the Dark, it naturally does that. How does Rebel Crown work with sort of the base building kind of element of Blades? Yeah, it's a grander scale. Like you're building, like where instead of building like your crew and your hideout and stuff, like of Scoundrels and Blades in the Dark, you're building your legion and your base of power and you're taking over whole like swaths of land mm. and castles and in downtime and in like the, as the result of the things that you do in play, there's a lot of zooming out that happens mm -hmm. that's based on things that you do sort of in the moment to moment role playing of your characters. So you're playing your characters and you're kind of hitting like the highlights of the things that they're doing, but that kind of uh, encapsulates and sort of drives like the bigger picture that you're trying to accomplish. And those bigger picture things is what lets you, for lack of a better term, like win the game. So there are these big chunky steps that you're trying to take. Is, is that kind of accurate michael do you think oh absolutely yeah and i think that is where we get some like kind of aha moments in play and in, in playtesting especially was when people realized like oh at the end of this sortie like the end of the session we might rule the city we're not doing like let's like not you know knock over this one building or something because a lot of people do come in with some blades experience but like we there might really be a bigger scale here of, of what we're trying to accomplish in a single session and then we like cut ahead to the next season where you like you rule this province and like you've got vassals reporting to you and people coming to you trying to make alliances and and then you can really get some some interesting momentum there that's one of the things that some people don't quite get because they're used to games where you're kind of like everything that you're playing in the game is just minute to minute to minute mm. you know encounter the beginning of an adventure to the end you know you're kind of right there where this is much more zoomed out and there's a lot more happening as a result of the things that you're doing and that can be tough on the gm actually the gm really has to understand <laughs> that yeah it's tough and michael is <laughs> amazing at it we play sometimes and i'm like god damn dude <laughs> there's a lot of improvisation but there's a lot of like under you need to understand that you're not hitting every single moment you know you're doing you know broader bolder strokes with everything that you're doing in the game and you're accomplishing much more it's super exciting it gets to be really really exciting and then the question from a design perspective is how do you like communicate that so the players can see the structure there like how can they see the skeleton of the campaign and i think that's where like the domain sheet can help right if you're like mm -hmm. oh we're like we're going after holdings and like that's the goal of our sortie we're like going out there and we're going to try to take this castle we're going to try to take this town like here are the stakes so we know that's what we're driving for this session it's more of a long game <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah yeah exactly yeah a long game where you're role playing the highlights the like the stuff that you see on screen in game of thrones you know the next episode you see all the stuff that has changed mm. you know in, in the landscape you're right you got rid of all the walking i appreciate that 
<laughs> it does sort of it does sort of feel like almost uh like a history book kind of take on role playing, right? Like where you're sort of sketching out these big set pieces of action mm. and then dialing in what the main like the generals on the battlefield are kind of like trying to figure out what they're thinking and portraying that in a way that's sort of like dramatic in you know, without being for a history book, you're trying to portray the truth of the the event, but sort of like a similar kind of like constantly moving the camera. You know, it's kind of reminding me of, is it microscope? Mm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. The way that, you know, you kind of zoom in and out of the timelines, there's like a similar vibe to that. Absolutely. Have you played microscope? Oh yeah, yeah. All of Ben Robbins' games, I think are pretty brilliant. And I think microscope in terms of like setting a clear expectation for scope of time between players, like, okay, we're here, we're going to look at a day, but it's going to be like the defining day in mm. this 10 years is really cool stuff. Yeah. And the whole thing comes in a box. Yeah. So the thing I wanted to uh, <laughs> connect. So the reason we have a box is because we had the supplement we were working on, Serpent and Oak. We knew that there would be at least two books. So we had to hold the books together. And then in the middle of development, right? Like we've finished the core zine. People were like, could you do this in like six sessions? And we we're like, nah, nah. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so we went through and we devised a different framework for the campaign. And the Serpent campaign especially is like, hey, okay, well, let's take a different kingdom of different factions and we'll start like way closer to the end point. We'll start mm -hmm. with a pretty established power and if we're doing this in smaller sessions, it's probably more predictable what players are going to do. And so we could give example like missions and example dangers and like example approaches that would really like show a GM like, okay, how do you zoom in on this one moment and like set stakes there, but show that that's going to ripple out and you're going to like, you're going to rule this whole province by the end of the session. We thought we couldn't do that. But I think that's going to be really helpful for people who want to like, who want to try this in, the, in a smaller time frame because we wanted to build this kind of like history book game that would be play out over many sessions and really like build something and like build something big in terms of your like feel like you're taking over a kingdom, but also like have those like long callback relationships that change over time. That's not what everyone wants to do or you want like an intro to that. And so it's cool that the Serpent campaign kind of became that like primer to and condensed form. And now when we get, when we, you know, go to cons again and can bring our purple crown, like that's the one we'll slap on the table. Yeah, that's what we'll do. Sometimes you just want to watch the History Hour documentary, one hour and you're done. Nothing wrong with one and done. And that being said, you do have the campaign set up now for this game. And we are actually talking to you as the game is being released. Now, normally when we talk to creators, we talk to you right before the Kickstarter happens or like right midstream of the Kickstarter. Our listeners can get this game right now, right? Yeah, it's out. Our site is narrativedynamicspress.com. And we like, the zines are there. We also have an HIO page where we have PDF codes. But yeah, as of yesterday, like hot off the presses, it's out for distribution. Ooh, I'll get my Kickstarter copy soon. Yay. Mm -hmm. Yes, you will. So that's very cool. Now, if our listeners who are very much inclined to buy box sets want to pick up a box set, when will that be available for purchase? We're going to start shipping out the box sets mid-March, so a matter of weeks. We decided to go all in for a gold foil cover, which turns out actually takes significantly more time uh, in the COVID <laughs> era. So it's going to look amazing, but yeah, it'll be out mid-March. And it's worth it. Just the whole idea of having like, boxes everything should be in boxes if it's a role-playing game like i feel like the box is sort of like a central role-playing game appeal right mm. boxes are like filled with mystery and you want to open them and <laughs> as soon as i saw that you were going to put the zines in a box i was just like i need the box i, I can't just get the zines like that would be crazy and it's got pencils and special dice too yes so, um, yeah emblazoned with the uh the crown skull of a rebel crown. So you're going to have all the stuff you need in there. In addition to looking really good on a bookshelf, it's a great excuse just to make our custom dice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, you guys are including dice, which is fine enough, but you're including pencils. Pencils is like a next level move. Ooh, yeah. Sign me up. <laughs>
Well, it's been absolutely amazing chatting with you both. And before we let you go, Tweet Tweet on the Street heard a little rumor that you're coming in under the wire with a special zine quest project. Can you tell our listeners about that? Absolutely. Font is a story game of hope and loss. It's a GMless game we've been working on for a while and iterating on it in small steps. And we're finally putting it out for a, a physical release, which we're really excited about. It is about travelers leaving a dying kingdom into this strange landscape, looking for a miraculous power that might save their world. Ooh. It is running through March 9th, so you can find it in ZineQuest, and we really hope you check it out. Very cool. Well, you can count on us to back it. Stu's been throwing money left and right at zines, and so have I. So many. So, Eric, Michael, why don't you tell our listeners where they can find you on their internet, where they can find your wares once again, and where they can pick up Rebel Crown. We sell our stuff through narrativedynamicspress.com. Narrative Dynamics is our partnership. And there's the itch.io page, right, Mike? And that's linked off of the uh, Narrative Dynamics mm-hmm. Press. That's right. Yeah. You can buy stuff there. You can download the, you know, your, your play sheets and, you know, different stuff like that. And, uh, you know, go crazy. And you can find me on Twitter at Dunn underscore O'Connor as of like last week. So <laughs> you could be one of the first in the door on that one. Very cool. I'm on Instagram at Woodsman, uh, W-O-O-O-D-S-M-A-N. And that's just, you know, my drawing and silly life and dog and chickens and stuff. So. <laughs> chickens are kind of like goblins. Oh my God, mm-hmm. you have no idea. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I have a rooster that's bigger than my oh, dog. Geez. So, you know. <laughs> well, very cool. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Thanks for having us on. Pleasure chatting with you both. This has been another amazing episode of the Vintage RPG podcast. Do where can the people find you? Oh, they can find me on Instagram at Vintage RPG, uh, posting stuff about, you know, cool zines like Goblinville Gazette every day, every day, Hambone, every day without fail. You think this was your job? <laughs> <laughs> You can find me on the Twitter at John McGuire RPG. I tweet about board games. I tweet about cute animals. I tweet about Dungeons and Dragons and other RPGs because there are more RPGs than just Dungeons and Dragons. You can follow my day-to-day adventures in podcasting and life over on Instagram at John Hambone McGuire. If you like the show, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. Your reviews really do help other listeners to find us. If you really like the show, think about joining our Patreon, patreon.com slash vintage RPG. We've got behind the scenes looks at Stu's new novel we've got some behind the scenes looks at my rpg point nemo we've also got early release episodes we have got a killer discord community that we'd love for you to be a part of patreon.com slash vintage rpg it's not a novel by the time you get done with that word count it will be (laughs) (laughs) so for Stu horvath i'm john hambone mcguire may the dice always roll in your favor Thanks for listening. Don't forget to like, review, and subscribe to the podcast. Every review helps other listeners to find us. The Vintage RPG Podcast is a ham-fisted production. Music by Dega West. Art by Schaefer Brown. If you like the podcast, you should also consider becoming a patron at patreon.com 